All right. Good morning, New Hope Volcano. Merry Christmas. <laughs> every, every, every day. Hallelujah. Well, welcome this morning. Uh, thank you for joining us. Another beautiful day the Lord has made. Amen. We shall be glad and rejoice in it. Thank you, Lord. Uh, so, as most of you know, we like to uh, share a little bit of the word and get into prayer before our worship time in the morning. Um, this morning, I spent a little bit of time in the book of Nahum. As <laughs> 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 some of you are thinking, what is that? <laughs> and if that's what you're thinking, you better come Wednesday night Bible study. <laughs> Things that are going on in this world, he sees everything. Nothing sneaks by him. Right he knows me. everything. He sees everything. Um, and in the book of Nahum, verses, chapter 1, verse 7, the word says, The Lord is good, a Amen. refuge in times of trouble. Thank you, he Lord. cares for Lord. those who trust in him. Praise Ooh, Praise God. God. And so as things go on all around us, we continue to focus on the Lord, trust in his, him and his plan for Amen. our lives and for our salvation. Amen. Thank you, Lord. If we can bow our heads this morning. Ah, oh, Heavenly Father, we come before you, humble hearts, open to receive from you whatever it is you have in store for us this morning, Lord. We pray that we can settle our hearts and our minds and we can just focus on you and trust in you, Lord, and your plan for us. Many of us are going through all kinds of different things, experiencing yeah. all kinds of different trials and tribulations. And, and we just thank you that we know that you have a plan for our, li our lives to prosper us and to give us a hope. And that hope is Jesus Christ, our Lord and Savior. Thank you, Lord. So this morning we worship you, giving thanks, giving you honor and praise. And we look forward to the day that we can be in your presence. Lord. Thank you, Lord. We, give, we thank you for this day. We give you all the glory, the honor, and the praise. And we pray in Jesus' mighty name. Amen. 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 Thank you, Pastor Jason. Everybody, please say Psalm 90. Ready, go? Psalm 90. Okay, here's what it says. Thank you. 
Thank you for Jesus and the ultimate price that you paid for our salvation. Father, we thank you for this beautiful place. We thank you for a beautiful day. We ask that your Holy Spirit uh, come in and touch each and every one of our hearts here, Father God, and speak to us in a way that only he can, Father God. We ask uh, for blessings on those, for those that are on uh, airwaves, on YouTube now, and later on on the replay, Father, that you bless them from the top of their head to the soles of their feet. Thank you, Lord. But, Father God, we ask that you just bless this praise and worship. Bless praise this service, you. Father God, because it's all about you, Father. In Jesus' mighty name, we pray. And everybody help me close by saying, Amen. 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 Your love is devoted like the ring of solid gold, like a vow that is tested, covenant of old. Your love is enduring through the winter rain, beyond the horizon, with mercy for today. Faithful you have been, faithful you will be. You 
let yourself be and that's why i sing your praise will never be on my lips 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 your praise Never be on my lips, thank you. Never be on my lips, your praise. Never be on my lips. Sing first one. Your love is devoted. Your love is devoted. Like a ring of solid gold. Like a vow that is destined. Like a covenant of hope. Your love is enduring through the winter rain, beyond the horizon of mercy of today. Faithful you have been, faithful you will be. You pledge yourself to me, and that's why I sing your praise. Ever be on my lips, ever be on my lips, your praise will ever be on my lips. Sing that chorus, say, on my lips, your praise will ever be on my lips, ever be on my lips, your praise will ever be on my lips, ever be on my lips. You father the orphan, your kindness made us whole. You shoulder our weakness as grace restores the soul. You're making me like you, clothing me in white, bringing beauty from ashes. You will have your bride. Faithful you have been, faithful you will be. You pledge yourself to me, and that's why I sing your praise. Never be on my lips, never be on my lips, your praise. Never be on my lips, sing that again. Never be on my lips, your praise. Thank you. 
Good morning. We have some announcements for you this morning. I'm going to call our sister Chris up to give us some of those announcements. Uh, but I'll go ahead and say for Wednesday night, we are in Ephesians chapter 5, if you want to join us. Um, Wednesday night, you can fill your belly, fill your heart, and fill your mind all at the same time. <laughs> so you can join us. Um, 5 o'clock, we have a meal till about 6 o'clock, and then we get into the Word of God. It's been awesome. It's been amazing. So we hope to see you there. Chris, thank you so much, sister. Good morning. Is this on? Oh, now it's on. Hallelujah. 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 Guess what? God loves you. Hallelujah. Yeah. Uh, Monday, people will be getting together to pray for you. So don't be shy. There's paper back there. Or write down your prayer request. Stick it in the bowl so they can pray specifically for you. Uh, Wednesday night, Bible study, 5 p.m. with dinner. Ooh. Thursday, hula, 5 o'clock. Yes. yes, yes. Friday morning at 8 a.m., the Yard Ninjas will be here. Ooh. If you'd like to join them, show up. Uh, Friday night at 6 p.m., celebrate recovery. Yeah. yeah. Hallelujah. <laughs> Um, Saturday, this coming Saturday, the 21st, men's ministry, including yeah. breakfast, of course, at 9 a.m. And women's ministry is always the last Saturday at 8 a.m., only on Zoom, so that'll be uh, September 28th. We are currently on YouTube Live. We've got about 10 or 15 people watching on YouTube Live. Um, we're also at newhopevolcano.com. If you want to know anything about us, check some things out. And if you're looking for a way to share about this fabulous church, you could share our website or share my weekly emails or share individual videos from our YouTube channel. Huh. I like I wrote myself a note while I was coming up here and I was like, where did I put that note? The note is, how will you serve? Are you looking for a way to serve? Are you feeling like there's something more you'd like to do? I know a lot of you are already doing a lot of things, but if you're looking for a way to serve, just ask me because we're um, we're ramping up to the Christmas fair, and there's a lot of things that go on behind the scenes that you could get involved in, or even in front of the scenes. Uh, don't forget, all glory and honor are His. Mahalo. Hallelujah. So you mean the mic wasn't on earlier when I was talking? Yeah. Oh, yeah. So you guys didn't, didn't hear my joke. Why did the Christian chicken cross the road to get a cross? <laughs> well, this <way. laughs> All right. Hallelujah. So that's it for announcements, I believe, this morning. Um, we're about to pray over the tithes and offerings. I think Chris spoke about it. We have a website, newhopevolcano.com. You can check it out. Um, all kinds of cool stuff on there. But if you want to give online, if you're uh, tech savvy that way, uh, you can go to the website on the top of the home screen. There's a hamburger menu. You can click down. It says give online. You enter your information and you can give that way. If you're in the building and you want to give, we have an offering boy in the back where our sister Gala is sitting. Feel free to drop your tithe or your offering down uh, into the offering bowl at any time. <clears throat> of course, we want to preface that by saying, if you are visiting us for the first time, please hold back on your money and just be blessed with what the Lord has in store for you this morning. If you're visiting us from another church, we welcome you, but we ask that you too please hold back on your money and take it to your home church. And if this is your home church, we ask that you please give with a cheerful heart. If we could bow our heads. Heavenly Father, so grateful, Lord. We thank you for the gift of life that you have blessed us with this morning, that we can awaken and be in your presence. Some of us with aches and pains, Lord, and we just pray your healing touch upon those people. But Lord, with every breath that we are alive and living, we just want to honor you and worship you. We want to spread the good news of the gospel to everyone around us. And we pray that you strengthen us in doing so, Lord. This morning, we come together as your children, the body of Christ, 
to praise your holy name, Lord. We come before you with open hearts, with open minds, with ears to hear, Lord, so that when we hear your word this morning, that it may dwell in our hearts richly. We thank you for providing for us in every way, for knowing what we need, for caring for us. As your word says, to cast our cares on you because you care for us. And we thank you for that. We lift our tithes and our offerings up to you. We pray that you multiply it in abundance. And most importantly, we pray that we use it according to your will. Lord, we lift our uh, our brother David Kea up to you as he's about to share the word with us this morning. That you speak to him and touch each one of our hearts this morning. We love you so much, oh Lord. We give you the glory, the honor, and the praise. And we pray in Jesus' name. Amen. Amen. Brothers and sisters, if you can help me welcome our brother David Kea this morning to the word of God. Morning, everybody. Morning. Try that one more time. Good morning, New Hope Volcano. Good morning. Oh, thank you so much, sister. Love you. All right. How's everybody? How was that worship, huh? Holy Spirit filling everybody's hearts. Good. So today's message is entitled Doubt Your Doubts. And I'm going to add a little bit on to that, uh, the end of that. But the main message is doubt your doubts. But you want to believe your beliefs. Doubt your doubts and believe your beliefs. You know, it, as time goes on and as things are happening around the world and more and more violence appears, more and more things that just are not good keep coming out. Everything keeps going coming out into the open where it's visible and everybody can see it. There's a place in my heart, and I don't know about you folks, but there's a place in my heart that's like, Lord, what about all of us? What about the chil your children? What about your servants? It seems that the world is getting worse and worse and worse, and there's no consequence. It seems that the rich keep getting richer. The violence keeps getting more. And it seems like there's no consequence behind it. And I was having a really hard time with this. And I was, you know, praying about it and everything. Of course, when you're in touch with the Holy Spirit, he speaks to you loud and clear. And he brought me to the third book in um, Psalms and chapter 73. And that's what we're going to be talking about today. Now, on the back of your notes, I did put the whole psalm. So if you want to follow along with that, you can. It has all the verses numbered. Um, <clears throat> and if you want to use your Bible, then please use your Bible or your iBibles. Um, go ahead and use those two to follow along with it. Um, but before I get started, I just uh, would like to pray. So could everybody join me? Heavenly Father, we're here today to hear your word through the Holy Spirit. We thank you for the words that you've provided for us in the Bible. We ask the Holy Spirit to speak to us in a way that only he can, to understand these doubts as they arise in our lives. In Jesus' name, I pray, and everybody help me close by saying, Amen. Amen. So, congregation, I want to discuss doubt in God today, even amongst believers. How many of you have had doubt in your thoughts? Just me? Okay. How many of us have had doubts about God and his justice? Yeah? How many of us have had um Doubts about his goodness. If you say no, I implore you to search your heart again. Because I can guarantee you that doubt has entered your thoughts, especially doubt towards God, because it's part of our DNA. It's part of us. Doubt can shake our faith, and it can make us question God and his ways. 
I'm going to say that again. Doubt can shake our faith and make us question God and his ways. As I was thumbing through the book of Psalms, 73rd Psalm, written by Asaph. Now, does Asaph sound familiar to any one of you? Yes? Good. Because it wasn't to me. Right? Asaph, it's not something, it's not a household name. Right? But I found out he's... Um, he was a leader and a worshiper in Israel. <clears throat> and from what I read about him, he was held in, a, in very high esteem amongst the Levites who saw, oversaw that temple. It's not a, he's not a common household name like Jesus is or Holy Spirit or Luke or John or Matthew, right? But he has a legacy. He occupies a significant space in the Holy Scriptures. So before I dive in, I want to introduce Asaph. So let's walk through his resume, if you will. What do we know according to the word? We learn about Asaph through various points in scripture. Second Chronicles 29 and 30, First Chronicles 6 through to 6 and 39, 15 and 17, 15 and 19, and 16, 5. So we know something about this guy in the scriptures. And here's a couple of things that we know through that. His lineage, right? We know he was the son of Berechiah, the door holder at the temple. He was a descendant of Gershom, which means he's the son of a Levite, which makes him what? A Levite, right? The Levites were defenders of the Mosaic law during the Exodus. My point is, he's descended from a priestly tradition. As a Levite, his duties were singing songs during temple services, constructing, maintaining, and guarding the temple. Levites were also teachers and judges. Basically, they were the source. They were the go-to of how to do life. Amen? Asaph wasn't just any Levite, though. He was the Levite in charge of the music before the Ark of the Covenant. Wow. He occupied the special place. He was appointed by King David himself as music director. And in 2 Chronicles 29 and 30, he's called a seer, which means that he was also acknowledged as a prophet. He was very prophetic. If you read his uh, psalms that he wrote, he was appointed originally to serve before the ark with the grandson of the prophet Samuel. This is how esteemed Asaph was in his culture. In his day, he served through not one, not two, but three kings. He served from David to, to Solomon to Rehoboam. <clears throat> Rehoboam, excuse me. His accomplishments, well... He's credited with authorship of Psalms 73 to 83 and Psalm 50. 73 to 8, that's 11 psalms. If he penned all those psalms and they were attributed to him, then he also spoke prophetically in some, because some of those songs, if you look at them, they're messianic songs. Pointing to Jesus. His contribution to the Holy Scriptures is greater than most of the minor prophets. He has more ink in this word of God than Titus, James, and Peter. He has a legacy. When you see um, the reference in here to the Asaphites. The Asaphites were a guild of musicians who served the first in the first temple in first chronicles 16 4 through 5 david appointed appointed certain levites to minister before the ark of the lord and to record and to thank and to praise the lord god of israel wow so asaph was a chief and next to him zechariah remember zechariah okay cuz i'm going to come back to him later on this is Asaph. He penned these words. And if you look, 
at the beginning of Psalm 73, he started it with, surely God is good to Israel, to those who are pure in heart, and to those who are called by your name. Asaph is about to take us on a, on a journey. We're going on a journey in Psalm 73. And it starts with a declarative statement, right? Surely God is good. God is good to Israel. He's good to those who are called by his name. He's good to his people. This is where Asaph starts, right? And he's starting here for a specific reason. Because he's driving a stake in the ground. He's making a concrete foundation. Setting that foundation because... Where he's about to take us is on a journey of crisis and faith. Asaph, who was a rock star, in my words, right? He's, he's just the bomb. And he takes um, <clears throat> his culture, and he's known so much as a mighty man of God. He's not known as, you know, anybody... He, He's somebody that you would want to kind of look up to, I guess. He was a great example, a great mentor. And if you knew him and if you were familiar with him, then you know he speaks directly to God. He gathers praise from the people, and then he takes that and he delivers that to God. That's amazing. So... He starts with a declarative statement, right? God is good. God is good. Good to the pure in heart. God is good to his people. Israel, he says. But something broke in Asaph. Something went. The truth that he knew and the world that he experienced just went separate ways. They completely disconnected. Look at verse 2. He says, but as for me, my feet almost slipped. I came close <laughs> to stumbling. My steps, they had almost slipped off that foundation on which I walked is what he's saying. Those that which I knew to be true, that which I relied upon to take my next steps, my feet almost slipped. Suddenly, this whole thing became really shaky to me, Lord. This was his challenge. I think my goal this morning, if I had a goal, it would be to surface tension. To bring it up to, that, to the surface, to bring it out. Because if we're honest and we're still, and if we can reflect, we all struggle with this. Asaph went through a season in this dark tunnel, a season where his heart just took a beating. And in that season, we see that he's asking a question. He wants to understand, why is it the wicked prosper and the righteous suffer? And he goes into a detailed explanation here. Hold on, gang, because we're going we're gonna to go a little bit deeper. If you need a life preserver, go see Pastor Eric. Anyway, um, but hang on, because we're going to go deeper. But that theme, that narrative, that idea, it's, it's planted in each and every single one of us. And whether we bring it to the surface and deal with it, or whether it just festers right underneath the surface, we got to come to a point where we actually hit this idea in the face and we hit it head on. Sometimes the truth we know and the life we experience are miles apart. Can I get an amen? amen? Right. Some of us have been there. And if you haven't, guess what? You will be. I promise you. Because it's our human experience. So let's look at Asaph's words. This is what we need to understand about this song. This is a godly man who walked with God, a man who was prominent in his culture and known to be representing God. He serves before the ark. He serves in the tabernacle in the temple. 
<clears throat> and he's appointed by the king. He is the bomb. He's a rock star in his day. And this is his outside. But guess what? On the inside, we're going to see something. We're going to see his heart because we're about to see this inner struggle. And we're about to see this inner turmoil and the stuff that he's dealing with on the inside that nobody else sees, right? And all of us have this mask on the outside. How are you? I'm fine. Right? But are you fine? No. But we have this on the outside. I love this song because you don't get this opportunity often. And yet it's, it's a song. These are the thoughts of a man that God determined are worthy to be in Scripture. They're here for a reason. But they're here for us. Amen. He says, for I was envious of the arrogant. I saw the prosperity of the wicked. They have no pains in their death. Their body is fat. Not this kind of fat. In other words, they just slide right on along, even unto death, not even a care in the world. Their body is fed. They have excess. That's what that means. They have more than they need. They're not in trouble as normal men are. Most of us wake up every day and we've got a stack of stuff that we have to deal with. Amen? Right? We have mortgages to pay. We've got kids to take care of. Right? We've got tests to take. There's all kinds of things that hit our radar as soon as we open our eyes in the morning. Amen? So Asaph is saying, these guys don't have to worry about that stuff. You don't have to worry about nothing. They don't have trouble like normal men. They're not plagued like mankind. They wear pride around their neck like a necklace. It adorns them. It's over their hearts. This is who they are. They wear a garment of violence that covers them. They're used to getting their way. Their eyes bulge from fatness. Their imaginations of their heart run riot. In other words, if they can imagine it, guess what? They can do it. They have no boundaries. They mock. They wickedly speak of oppression. They speak from on high. They have set their mouths against the heavens. This is his experience. This is the guy who's serving for the Ark of the Covenant. Covenant, excuse me. And in his experience, in his world, that's what he's seen. A group of people who have no regard. No regard for God whatsoever. Does that sound kind of familiar? Kind of what we're dealing with today. Not only do we have every not only do they have everything that they need and then some, not only do they always get their way. They even speak from on high as if they are their own God. As if they don't need God. And yet they just keep rocking and rolling. Nothing happens to them. They set their mouth against the heavens and their tongue parades throughout, uh, yeah, throughout the earth. They make disciples. That's scary. They make disciples. They've got a worldly philosophy. They have a way of doing things. It seems that in their life, there is no God. They're saying, I'm my own God. I'm the center. And I get my way. I do what I want to do. And Asaph's looking at this and he's saying, my goodness, this is actually working. This is where his struggle is, right? He's like, man, this is, I mean, what's going on here? It's actually working. So therefore, his people return to his place. And the waters of abundance are drunk by them. And they say, how does God know? And there is no knowledge with the most high. See, there's a place we can go. If we are believing that we are independent, there is a place that pride can take us. Amen. 
There's a place we can go ultimately where we believe we don't need God. And this is what he's describing. The wicked who don't believe they need God, they're doing just fine. He said, behold, the wicked, they're always at ease and they have increased in their wealth. This is what he sees. This is what he knows. He observes this with his eyes and he understands it with his mind. And that's the experience he's dealing with. And then we see he looks inward. He says, you know what? Verse 13. Surely in vain I have kept my heart pure. I wash my hands in innocence. He's turned to himself now. And he's saying, God, you know, I do this the best I can. I try to walk with you. I try to keep my heart pure. I try to keep my hands clean, trying to do the right thing. I am your guy. You selected me. And yet I look around and I see that's their experience. They say, you know, we've got a secret place that we know that God doesn't even go to. Or no. I look at them and they just keep on trucking along like nothing. And look at me. This is Asa. Look at me. I've been stricken all day long and chastised every morning. This is the tension that is his experiencing. We see that he makes a choice in verse 15. And this is a great choice. He says, you know what? If I will speak thus, behold, I would have betrayed the generation of your children. <coughs> if I will speak thus, behold, I would have betrayed the generation of your children. Hold that thought for a second. Let me put that on to the side. Okay, I'm going to come back to it. He makes the right call. He makes a good choice here. His struggle is seeing this and why do they prosper, right? This, and it's in, inside, it's tearing him apart, ripping his heart out. He's not spreading it out. He's not letting everybody know about it between him and God. And he's saying, you know, for the sake of the children, the keiki, for the sake of the next generation, I understand my role. I'm a person of influence. I understand I occupy a piece of real estate that you design, Lord. You put me in this place. And the last thing I'm going to do is discourage other people's confidence in you. I may be struggling with you, but I'm not going to discourage other people. But God, you got to know my confidence is shaking right now. So he makes the choice. He's not going to get in the way of other people's relationship with the Lord. But he does say this in verse 16. He says, when I pondered to understand this, it was troublesome in my sight. I tried to understand. I observed when I saw. I put it all together. And this word troublesome, this world is troublesome in my sight. He's describing a churning of an inner man, a churning of his spirit, in other words. And he's telling God, this is throwing me off. I really having a hard time with this. Have you ever been there? Amen. Sometimes this shows up in a crisis. Most times it does. And sometimes we hit a season or a stretch where everything we know about God's goodness just comes crashing down around us. Take a look at what's going on in Israel. Remember his first statement, right? What did he say? God is good to Israel, to those who are called by his name. We can look at this in this way. God is good. Amen. I buy into that 100%. I got it. 
But what we really want to know is this. Okay, ready? Hold on now. It is going to blow your mind. Ready? Is God good to me? That's what we want to know. I think this is where we break as human beings. A lot of times this is where we break to create a category, an academic category, if you will. We can say God is good. I think, I think you can all buy into that, right? Everybody say God is good. Yeah, everybody agrees on that, right? I mean, especially here, right? We all know that. Yeah, God is good. But if you and I got real still and we got real quiet and along with our thoughts and ourselves in a place that nobody else is present except God, and we ask that question, is God good to me? That's a different question. And probably pushes back a different answer at times. <sighs> like when you get a phone call that brings sad news, someone you love dearly passing suddenly. Or the ministry that you are in is no longer interested in your calling to the kingdom. I think <clears throat> in that mode, in that crisis mode, we ask that hard question. Is God good to me? And I think each and every one of us can relate to that. I think all of us have seen those reasons or recognized those seasons that uh, when that break happens, when it, that disconnect happens. But for most of us, I think there is a more dangerous place that we can go. Worse than that, it can erode our confidence in God's goodness to us. And that's what I'm going to call the low hum. You know, like when you have feedback, the slow, low hum. I'm going to call it the low hum. That white noise, it kind of just floats in the background of our thinking. That unless we're really paying attention, we tend to just push it off to the side and we get distracted and we do something else. That little hum, I believe, are lies that we believe. <laughs> These are scripts that play in us over time. You know, some of us have been carrying some of those scripts since we were little kids. Some of us has gotten so familiar with those lies that are spoken into our lives that we hardly recognize them as being separate. They're just a part of us. Just how I am, right? They're part of our DNA. They're part of, they're part of our filters, right? They're part of how we view the world. This low hum is very, very dangerous. It's more da dangerous than the seasons of crisis that we come into. Can I be transparent with you? I'll tell you a couple of my lies. Number one, what you do for the Lord doesn't matter. You can make an impact. You can't make an impact. You know why? Because you don't fit in with them. You're not one of them. You go ahead. You get into God's word. It doesn't matter. It just floats out there, right? See, if nothing I do matters, then that really impacts my choices, doesn't it? Right? That impacts my relationship with God. If nothing I do matters, because God says that everything that I do matters. Amen? Amen? Hold every thought captive, he says, right? I mean, the scriptures are saturated with this message, right? Everything matters. And yet, and yet, that low hum, the lie that moves in the background, in my mind, still is nothing you do matters. Lie number two for me, and it's a big one. And I think some of you can probably relate to this. You're alone. By yourself, figuring this out. Buck up. 
You got skills. You got resources. You got lots of stuff. Do what you can with it. See if you can take it on and take on the day and overcome the day. You got a challenge. You got a challenge coming up. It's all about me. You got to figure this out on your own because you know exactly what to do. You've been trained on what to do. That's the second low hum that I deal with daily. These crisis moments where we can experience um, what Asaph is experienced is where we break, right? With the tr we break with the truth that we know and the world that we observe and the things that we think are just miles apart, amen? And that's where Asaph's living right now. That's where he is in this song. Until there's always a great turnaround. God uses everything for his good. Verse 17. Verse 17. Until I entered the sanctuary of God. Ooh. Oh, I got all chicken skin. Until I entered the sanctuary of God. Asaph would have had access to the sanctuary. He was familiar with the goings on of the sanctuary. And so in this psalm, this journal of Asaph, he transitions from, hey, God, right? He describes his struggle. He's like, oh, my goodness, the righteous suffer, the wicked prosper. It's tearing me up. And then he entered into the presence of God. And that's the moment everything changed. What's going on in the sanctuary of God? Asaph served both in the tabernacle and the temple. He's familiar with the sacrifices, right? Maybe he steps in and he starts observing with his eyes. Check out this perspective. It's not a fluffy scene, okay? When I first read this, I was pondering, what is the sanctuary? What is the sanctuary? What does the sanctuary mean? What does it have to do with this? Did he have a good, quiet time with God? Did he listen to a great praise song? You know, what's the sanctuary? I'm pretty sure that the sanctuary in this case is the sanctuary of God. He's in that place where he's gazing upon an altar. A blood-soaked altar. It could be animal parts on there, right? It could have just been moments ago that a lamb's neck was lifted and slipped from left to right there. I think this is what he's looking at. He's in the presence of God. He's looking at the cost of sin. He's looking at God's hatred towards sin and the consequences of that wrath. That God pours out on sin. His whole perspective changed. Everything changes. Now he's considering the wicked. He says, you set them in slippery places. I'm thinking about my feet slipping. But my goodness, look at the godless. Those who walk away from you. Those will have nothing to do with you. And they don't even know that they are in slippery places. It's not a good thing to not think that you need God. It's not a good thing to be in that place where you have such abundance that you feel you have no needs. It's not a good place to be. It's not a good thing. It's a dangerous place to be believing that we're self-sufficient. It's dangerous to believe that we can always have our way. It's dangerous to think we're not dependent on God, the God of creation for every single breath. It's a dangerous place to be. And he's saying, you set them in slippery places. And he describes their next. But he's not done yet. 
Because you can't be standing in the presence of God and considering God's hatred towards sin and the wrath that he pours out upon the injustice. We're talking about justice. Amen. <clears throat> We're standing in the middle of it and in the presence of God. And you can't be in that space and only consider the wicked. Asaph says, when my heart was embittered and I was pierced from within. He says, then I was senseless and ignorant. I was like a beast before you. In the presence of God, he realized this. He says, you know what? I've tried to keep my heart pure, but it's not pure. I've tried to keep my hands clean, but they're not clean. That sacrifice that I'm looking upon right now is also for me. And everything gets flipped completely upside down. It gets inverted, doesn't it? Suddenly, he's not comparing himself to other people. He's comparing himself to God's standard for him. Amen. He's realizing that for me, I was a brute. I was senseless. I was ignorant before you, God. And suddenly that shift, his attention, his focus is no longer on them and us and me and mine. Now he's looking at God. And I love the way this ends. <clears throat> Look at how he, he brings it down. Verse 25. Nevertheless, I am continually with you. You have taken hold of my right hand with your counsel. You guide me. And afterwards, you receive me to glory. You receive me to glory. Whom have I in heaven but you? And nothing besides you I desire on the earth. My flesh, my heart, they will fail. But you, God, are the strength of my heart and my portion forever. Verse 27. For behold, those who are far from you will perish. You have destroyed all those who are unfaithful to you. But as for me, the nearness of my God is my good. I have made you the Lord God of my refuge that I may tell all of your works. Do you see what just happened? Suddenly he's in the presence of God. And it's all about God. Right? And look where he takes this. Remember he started with the question. We started with this question. Is God good? Is God good to me? Right? His struggle is that he's not seeing it right. Seeing it right. But the time... But by the time he steps into the presence of God, he is seeing exactly what God's goodness really is. And he's experienced it in the most intimate way that you can. Right here. In his heart. He says, nevertheless, I'm continually with you. God's presence. God's nearness. He says, this is the goodness of God. In verse 28, in case we missed it, he says, for me, the nearness of God is my good. He says, I have made the Lord God my refuge. God is the strength of my heart and my portion. He's not no longer looking at the success of other people. He's looking at his portion. And God says, you know what your portion is? God says, your portion is me. <laughs> Is that enough? Asaph says yes. And he finishes with that I may tell of your, all your works. Right? So now I'm going to take us on two quick side roads and then we'll wrap the message up. Do you remember earlier? This is really cool. Asaph made a choice, right? In verse 15, he said, if I have talked about this openly, I would have betrayed the children the generation of your children. If you read in scripture, 
there's a guild of musicians and singers called Asaphites. These were his descendants, and it appears to me that his choice in that moment to honor God, in spite of the circumstances, carried forward for generations. He has a legacy of faithfulness. There were others who came behind him, both in both physical lineage, and others came in the spirit of him, who ultimately became worship leaders in the spirit of, of Asa, and they were called Asaphites. That's one road. The other road I want to take you down is really, really cool. It's really fascinating to me. I mean, it's just amazing. You have this amazing leader, right, Asa, and you know he's an amazing man. He's His amazing moment is when he enters into the sanctuary of God, enters into God's presence. Remember I told you, remember about Zechariah, right? Asaph's brother, Zechariah. Zechariah's reference in a conversation that Jesus is having in Matthew 23, verses 33 to 36. I did not put it on your notes, <clears throat> but you can look it up later, I think. No, I did put it on the notes, excuse me. Because it kind of came to me and I was just like going off. Jesus is talking specifically, right, to the relig religious leaders of his day. And guess what? He's not being a nice guy, right? He's calling them snakes and a brood of vipers, right? And he said, how will you escape being condemned, condemned to hell? Therefore, I'm sending you prophets and sages and teachers. Some of them you will kill. And you will crucify others. You will flog them in your synagogues and pursue them from town to town. And so upon you will come all the righteous blood that has been shed on the earth. Wait for it. From the blood of the righteous Abel to the blood of Zechariah, son of Berechiah, whom you murdered between the temple and the altar. What he's saying is Zechariah was Asaph's brother. <clears throat> and some scholars believe that it was upon the murder of his brother that Asaph wrote Psalm 73. If you think about it, if it's true, if that's what Asaph was really struggling with, then he's really directing his thoughts and his anxiety towards Solomon, king over Israel. As Asaph seems to be making a distinction between Israel and those who are called by your name. And this is where he's struggling. He's struggling with the fact that if God is good, okay, I got it. God is good. God is good to Israel. Okay, but we have a king on the throne of Israel who murdered my brother. If that's how this sequence went down, that's why he's getting ripped up on the inside. Think about it. I got to go before the Ark of the Covenant every day and do my thing and put on this mask. Yet I'm sitting here in a culture where I'm looking at others who are Israelites, who are just moving on down the road like nothing without any care. If we take those descriptions of the wicked, and pour it back into the context of what we're talking about here, suddenly you see this guy is super tore up on the inside. But he finishes in a really interesting place. For those who are called by your name. In Acts 4.12, we hear salvation is found in no one else, for there is no other name but Jesus under heaven to mankind which we must be saved. Is it possible that the gospel is tucked into even Psalm 73? Is it possible that this struggle that Asaph had to endure led him to a place where he understood God, that there's a relational connection with God, that there is a God who is good, and God is good to those who are called by his name? Amen? Let's pray. Heavenly Father, 
I want to thank you for the opportunity to dive into the hearts of men who struggled similarly to us. Lord God, we know that at the end of the day, we know you're good. You're not just good, but you're good to me and to us. We know your goodness. We know that you're good, Lord. It's just who you are and that you want to express that goodness towards us. God, we just open our hearts and our minds and we declare it and we receive it. We just ask you, Lord, to lift us up with the experience of your goodness so that we can tell future generations. Now, while our eyes are still closed, I just wanted to say, some people here or online, it doesn't make any sense to them what I've just talked about. They want to know, they understand a little bit about struggling. They understand that they see the, the wicked prosper and others suffering. But they still don't get it. If you're questioning this, that's the Holy Spirit, I'm here to tell you. And he's knocking on your heart, on, on, on the door of your heart, and he wants to come in, and he wants to enlighten you. He wants to bring all of this joy that only God can give you. I implore you today to invite him into your heart. We're going to say a prayer here in a second. Um, I will formulate the words, but it has to come from your heart. Some of you in this room have been walking with God boldly, and you're like Asa. You're like, you know, I'm doing this every single day, but I don't see me getting better, Lord. I see them getting better. I invite you, too, to come and say this prayer, to rekindle your relationship with Jesus so that he can explain it to you through the Holy Spirit. And then, of course, there's some of us in the room here today who are boldly walking with God, that understand the struggles, but yet are still just stuck in that holy space with him. I implore you to, implore you to say the prayer with us, to edify your spirit, man, and to edify um, those around you. So whichever category you fall into, please repeat after me. Dear Jesus, Jesus. I'm a sinner. sinner. Haven't always listened to your ways. Or done in your ways. I want to change that now. I believe you died and rose the third day for my salvation. <clears throat> I love you, Jesus, and I thank you for taking my sin and my punishment so that I may be blessed in your sight. I say now so that my neighbor can hear me, the devil can hear me, I can hear me, and you can hear me. Jesus Christ is my Lord, and I will follow him forevermore. Thank you, Jesus, for loving me first. Thank you, Father, for those who have made new commitments. Thank you, Father, for those who have made um, recommitments. Father God, we just thank you so much for the stewardship of this gospel and this word. May it touch each and every heart that's here. In Jesus' mighty name, I pray. Everybody help me close by saying amen. amen. I was singing all kinds of songs in my mind when I was listening to that message. In your presence, in your presence, that's where I am. Right? In your presence, that's where I am strong. Seeking your face, touching your grace. In the breath of your love. My mic on? My, my mic is on. <laughs> my wife was checking if my mic is on. My mic is on. My shirt is on. My shoes, socks, hair.
everything is all <laughs> ladies and gentlemen this marks the formal conclusion to our sunday morning service we're grateful that you spent your time here this morning we uh pray lord uh, that you'll have a great rest of the week uh, we're going to sing one more song if you feel like singing stay in the room you can sing if you feel like singing as you walk out you can do that too if you're ready for your refreshments the refreshments have been already set up you can make your way out to the door there on my left if you're going to head out and enjoy the rest of this sunny day please be cautious as you get out to highway 11 as the cars speed up and down that road very very quickly whatever you decide to do have a great rest of your day